Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Kevin. Um, obviously, we'll um, just go through uh, the Crimper training uh, presentation this afternoon, the live webinar. Um, hope it's going to be informal and hope everybody uh, picks something up from it. Say any queries, uh, we'll try and address those at, uh, at the end of the session. A brief agenda. Obviously, everything revolves around uh, the safety, uh, and that's critical with the uh, the day and age that we live in. Um, a little bit about the hoses and the uh, the characteristics and the components. More about the couplings, and again, identification. A little bit about the machines, and obviously, what uh, what's necessary for cutting and, and marking. Hydraulic cleanliness is, is quite critical and here, because of the nature of the process, we want to stop contamination getting into uh, the, big, the big lumps, the big piston motors, the big piston pumps as a result of obviously um, the method that you use to, uh, to make the hose assemblies and then a little, little, little bit about the practicalities of the hose assembly. Safety points. Um, Everybody has a responsibility for safety and at Gates, we're um, no different to anybody else. We have a, a big play on hydraulics being completely safe and you'll see in the middle of the presentation slide there, uh, Gates safe hydraulics in Europe and we want to make sure that uh, this continues to be uh, the done thing. So it, it is a culture. So everybody has a responsibility and as the hose and coupling manufacturer, we obviously as Gates, we need to provide quality products that have to be reliable and properly tested and guaranteed. The machine manufacturer, the caterpillars of this world, they obviously have to design a safe and reliable hydraulic circuit. The assembly supplier, uh, again, that would probably be uh, sort of a typical distributor or a, a hose uh, manufacturer, uh, sub-supplier. He, he would obviously have to ensure that the, the way he makes the hose, that, that would be correct. And then the end user, the owner operator of the, the vehicle, he would obviously need to maintain that in accordance with the handbook that's provided and in accordance with any sort of legislation, any standards, and any re further recommendations by the uh, machine manufacturer. <clears throat> like in m most things in life, uh, hydraulics as such is, is uh, protected and shielded with various uh, ISO and Euro norms and British standards. And here, there's a standard that deals specifically with hydraulics. Uh, ISO 4413, and that protects uh, the machinery operators, any sort of workers that are around in the vicinity, and of course, Joe, Joe Public themselves. And with regards to the hood assemblies, it covers uh, replacement, the performance, marking for traceability, the storage and, and service life, i.e. how long they've been uh, sitting in the warehouse, the safe fitting onto the machine, of course, they obviously have to be put on uh, and they have to be uh, ensured that they are completely uh, put on correctly. Reductions of hazards. Um, when one of these obviously uh, goes off, it uh, sort of tends to flail all over the place. So we want to try and reduce the, the hazards of the, of the failure and, of course, the, uh, the ejection of the fluid. Um, the operating temperature uh, is quite critical to uh, the way the hose performs. And last but by no means least, the compatibility of the, the medium that we're putting through them um, as obviously now due to sort of environmental factors, we're now putting on onto vehicles uh, more and more synthetic or part synthetic or fully synthetic hydraulic oil. So we have to consider their compatibility with not only the pumps and the motors, but also with the, uh, the hose assemblies. So important safety rules, and this is regards to the replacement of hose assemblies. Um, bullet point here, 
Flexible hose assemblies shall not be constructed from hoses or couplings which have been previously used as part of a hose assembly. There is a temptation there, I guess, where uh, a hose has gone on a vehicle and obviously it can be seen to be reused by chopping the couplings off or part of the hose out and reusing it again. Uh, and that's something that must be, uh, you can't, can't do that. Uh, it's sort of refrained from doing it because obviously the hose has been on the vehicle for a period of time and it's been obviously uh, subject to all the stresses and strains that have been put on it. So the idea is that's cut up and scrapped and you make you make new. And and here in the, uh, the, the yellow box caution, never mix couplings and hoses from different manufacturers without a full test program and never recrimp or recoupled used hose. I think that's uh, pretty self-explanatory. Um, again, refrain refrain from doing that because brands really should go with brands. <clears throat> Performance requirements. Um, Gates is no different to, to anybody else, but here we like to pride ourselves in the fact that uh, the most important um, factor here is the impulse test and you see a picture with obviously uh, hoses um, and part of the impulse test. And really that's a, an on-off, on-off type of uh, cyclic test. And there are a number of uh, standards that obviously are applicable to the performance, the Euronorms, the ENs and the SAEs. And they set the basic criteria to for, for the host performance. But Gates, we actually go better than that. So instead of testing at uh, 150 or 200,000 cycles, we, we test up to 450 and 600,000 cycles, depending upon, upon the type of hose. So that actually gives you then uh, the, the benefit of something that's been tried, pro proven and properly tested. For marking, as you'll see from the pictures, uh, each and every coupling has got uh, a part number on there, and that's usually the assembler name, the data manufacturer, and the working pressure. The actual hose material itself has also got a date code on it, so there is uh, full traceability there, and that's quite important when you're looking at uh, sort of service and, and maintenance point of views. So, yep, marking is uh, all done in accordance with the ISO standard. <coughs> Hose lifetime, um, again, a British standard, uh, 5244. Uh, this is a, a recommendation, it's not, it's not law. But here, as you can appreciate, hose is a rubber product, a bit like your car tire. Um, the fact of the matter is it degrades and up to three years, a hose or a hose assembly or anything that's stored, it's perfectly okay to use, but between three and five and five to eight, you are advised to do some representative tests to make sure it is what it is. And obviously it's capable of doing the, the job that you're asking of it. And the recommendations are anything over eight years, you, you scrap it off. Hose lifetime. A lot of applications, uh, factors, um, you know, affect the hose and the way the hose performs. And there are several items here that are bullet pointed, which obviously will reduce the lifetime. And you can see some pictures here that also show you uh, what's right and what's wrong. Um, but essentially, uh, the flexing of the hose to less than the specified minimum bend radius uh, that's something we, we try and refrain from doing. The catalog page uh, will give you the, the minimum bend radius. Obviously, if you try and stick to that as best as you possibly can, then that will prevent any sort of undue failures, particularly on the outside of the bend radius where the hose is obviously bent, bent over double. Um, and then obviously uh, twisting, pulling, kinking, or crushing, or uh, any abrasion of the hose on the outside cover, again, uh, that will also shorten the life. And you'll see in the top right-hand corner here, the picture, this shows you uh, a 
which is a little bit difficult to see, but you'll see there's a white line actually going around the hose. That's the ley line of the hose. And obviously that will show you quite, uh, quite clearly that the hose is twisted and you want to maintain that ley line. As you can see in the, uh, the extreme right hand picture there, uh, it's, it's a nice uniform bend. You can see the hose is not twisted. And the point here, if you go to the bottom right hand corner, a seven degree of twist can shorten a hose life by 90%. So if you're looking at arbitrary figures here, a thousand hours for a hose to live, that will go in probably less than a hundred hours. So it's quite a, quite a catastrophic uh, point there that you need to make sure that there's no twist. Uh, another bullet point, obviously operating above the maximum, below the minimum temperature, and most uh, Gates hoses will go down to minus 40 up to plus 100. There are several that will go in excess of that, but they're proper high temperature uh, products. Um, exposing the hose to surge um, pressures above the maximum working pressure, and that's like uh, a little sort of fatigue. Uh, it's just in one point and it comes and goes and it's very cyclic. And again, you're pushing the hose to beyond its its maximum working pressure. And again, the hose will ultimately, uh, it'll fail. And common sense, intermixing hose connectors and doing uh, things with uh, assembly equipment that's not recommended by the manufacturer. Again, that will lead to um, an application that will ultimately fail and uh, it'll be uh, you know, a, quite a, a reduction in the life of the hose assembly. Reduction of hazards, obviously on, on vehicles that are going around uh, a site and obviously um, where Joe Public are, are involved, we want to try and reduce, uh, if there is going to be a failure, we want to try and reduce that hazard as, as much as we possibly can. Um, one of the things you can do is to, uh, in the top right-hand corner here, you'll see a little whip restraint. This, this is a little um, restraint that obviously goes around the hose as a piece of uh, piece of wire here, and it goes onto a sort of a link, and the link is then attached to uh, the adapter. And obviously, when the hose uh, ultimately fails, it's restrained on using that piece of wire so the hose doesn't flail around while the energy is being dissipated. It keeps it sort of integral and um, it uh, prevents uh, further damage to you know the, the, the machine and uh, the vicinity that it's in. Um, one of the products that uh, Gates does offer uh, on the bottom left here is uh, this lifeguard. And this is um, a product that goes on to, to hoses where um, the public and, and or operators are in line of sight and this prevents uh, the fluid ejection coming and perforating through the product and it points the, uh, the oil down into a um, um, safe place where obviously people are not going to get sort of covered and uh, with the hot oil and everything going around obviously it's not particularly uh, friendly stuff at the best of times but uh, so the lifeguard product will help with uh, fluid ejection. I think we've already sort of discussed uh, a little bit about the temperature and clearly uh, the catalog page will dictate uh, the two extremes. So usually down to minus 40 up to plus 100. But the thing to bear in mind here is um, if you're in the middle of Spain and you're operating at 100 degrees, you've also got to consider the ambient temperature that the machine is operating on. So it could well be that you uh, probably already exceed the, uh, the limits of the hose. So that's just something to bear in mind. Oil compatibility. Um, and here, uh, because of the environment and the way that obviously oil uh, is sort of frowned upon from, from leaking around vehicles and onto the ground these days. Um, oils are now going to uh, sort of part synthetic and fully synthetic. And people are using a lot of uh, rapeseed oil and all sorts of uh, wonderful chemical compositions. Um, 
the idea here would be if if you're not sure about the uh, the fluid that you're putting through, then uh, ask the manufacturer to give you a copy of the uh, the MSDS data sheet for the product, and then send that to application engineering at Gates, and we will tell you uh, its suitability and obviously if uh, it's something we've not uh, got any experience with, then we will have a look at it and consider. Um, what is necessary from the point of view of the, uh, the hose and the tube uh, material. The hoses themselves, well, why use a hose? It obviously gives you a degree of uh, movement. Obviously, if you've got cylinders and uh, the light moving around, then you have the capacity to, uh, to take that up with a hose assembly. It gives you some de degree of resistance to vibration. Of course, you don't have to weld or braze and there's no special bending equipment and tooling required. It's really easy to route around and it's uh, the hose is usually the last thing to go onto a vehicle as you're putting the vehicle uh, together. It's a good attenuator uh, as the hose takes on the pressure, it, uh, it grows in size just a wee bit. So it absorbs a lot of the, the sound of the, uh, of the medium going around the machine. It also dampens those uh, the pressure surges that you get. And of course, it's dead easy to obtain in the aftermarket. The components, obviously there is the inner tube and that seals in the fluid, but without the reinforcement, um, it won't resist any of the uh, pressure. So you need the braiding in its various guises to resist that internal pressure. And then the cover, that protects um, the tube and obviously the braiding, and that also deals with the outside environmental influences as well. Two main types of hose from Gates. The wire braid you see on the left, and obviously the spiral on the right-hand side here. And you can see a couple of differences uh, with that snapshot that shows you uh, the blues and the reds and the orange and the uh, the purples there, uh, how how they're branded and how you can identify the differences. The hose dash size. Um, the hydraulics industry is uh, still in the throes of being uh, designated in in the imperial way. It's not quite fully gone metric yet, so it's a bit of a mixed bag. But the way I always like to try and think about it is if I'm thinking in something in, in Imperial and I want to try and convert that into a hose or a coupling, then you take the inch and you divide it by 16. So 3 sixteenths, you divide that by 16 and you get a hose dash size three and so on. So one inch dash 16, three quarter, a dash 12 and if you can understand that then the rest of that sort of follows as i say for the hose size and the way the hose is designated and also for the coupling size so inches divide by 16 gives you the dash size and of course here we also show the the metric version of that as well the hose markings the ley line um Gates actually put something on uh, on, he on each and every hose assembly. It shows you the the branding, some nice coloured um, nomenclature there that shows you uh, who makes it, its part number, its size, its working pressure, all the relevant international standards. We've also put on there the date code when it's manufactured and also its flame resistance, the EMSHA. So everything you need to know about the hose is typically shown on there. And as you can see from the little picture, it tells you it's a dash eight. So this one here, it's an eight M3K. And then you will then see just after the, the 3000 there, there's a little symbol which shows you what type of coupling is actually gonna go onto that hose. And then it tells you the various pressures again mixed bag it's a bit imperial as a bit metric um 
and it tells you everything on there, all the applicable standards and so on. So the ley line really tells you everything you need to know about the product. The one slide I think if uh, we're going to take anything away from uh, the training today, I'd like to think that everybody would uh, take this one away. Um, the, the acronym used in the hydraulic industry is STAMPED. And so S stands for size. So common sense is if you take off a half inch hose, then you replace it with a half inch hose. Temperature, obviously, as we've already said, we work up to 100 degrees centigrade. And it's good to know what the operating temperature of the system is going to be prior to making any choice. The application, again, uh, be nice to know what that is. And again, we can make some choices depending upon where the hose is going on, what type of vehicle and what type of cover we need as to what type of uh, abrasion resistance we need to, uh, to give the hose assembly. The medium, we've obviously talked about uh, the, the type of fluid, the pressure, that's the most important sort of letter. And obviously from that, uh, you should, you know, uh, never replace a hose with a lower spec product. So if it's a 3000 PSI hose that you take off that's failed, you put on a 3000 PSI hose or better if you want to do it like that. Of course, uh, that's probably throwing a little bit of expense at it, but normally you would... Uh, replace a hose you would not replace a hose with a lower spec product the ends obviously the couplings and then the delivery delivery is usually a, a design consideration and here there is a little nomogram that uh, the design guy will use to size up the uh, the type of hose depending upon the pressure and the flow rate through it um, but if there's one slide to remember and the acronym is stamped Uh, a fairly new product from uh, from Gates is the MXT. Uh, it's a one wire braid hose, and typically this shows you how the specification of the product is presented. So you'll see on the right hand side it gives you the features and the benefits and the industry standard that it's tested to, the type of couplings, and obviously uh, it tells you the uh, the bend radius. And on the next slide, it will tell you the relevant standards that it's been uh, approved to, its construction, and obviously the temperature range, minus 40 to plus 100. And then a little snapshot will show you some of the, uh, the industries that it's uh, been used in, so construction, mining, ag, and then the various applications that obviously this particular product can be, can be used in control lines, auxiliary lines. And then we normally show a chart, a table like so. On the left-hand side, it will show you the, the dash size. Uh, and then it will show you the uh, the metric and the imperial. It will show the outside diameter of the, uh, the hose assembly, its uh, working pressure. And then just to take note, we also then put in its it's burst pressure and normally between the working pressure and the burst pressure there is a four to one factor of safety we then show the inside bend radius and then its weight and the one benefit of this particular product is that it's very light it's got a good bend radius and a good force to to bend so it's a, a very flexible product just typically here, a couple of snapshots that show you how we would present some of the spiral hose. And this is taken straight out of uh, uh, the catalog. Uh, and it shows you the different, uh, the different specifications and the different couplings and what the standards are relevant to it. And then the options at the bottom will show you the different covers that are available. And the same for this particular product. So this is the uh, 6,000 PSI hose. And again, it shows you the criteria, the bend radius, working pressure. It's obviously four to one factor of safety. And then it gives you the options of the covers. 
So all the information you need to know before you obviously make the choice, it's, it's, it's all in the catalogue. And then one of the options we talked about was different covers and, and uh, Gates has a sev several um, different covers here. We have the mega tough and the extra tough. And you can see on the right hand side here, uh, the standard cover, it's two times uh, more uh, resistant to abrasion than the competitors. And then depending on the options you make, you can either fit extra tough, which is 20, 25 times better, or the mega tough, which is 300 times better than the standard gates cover. And there you uh, have extremely durable hose that will withstand a lot of punishment. There are a couple of little things and little bits and pieces we can uh, throw at it to help it uh, improve even better. And on the next slide, you can see uh, a product called uh, Nylon Sleeve, the HG Sleeving. And again, that can go over the hose, over the outside cover, and we can put it on a couple of crimp rings to hold it there. And that just gives it that extra little bit of... Uh, uh, something to uh, to abrase against and rub against um, if it's in one of those sort of high um, abrasion type uh, applications. We can also put some polyurethane sleeving on. And again, that would just be something that's there to act as a bit of a sacrificial, as would um, the round steel spring guard. And then we do two, two armor guards, a, a flat steel armor guard and a thermoplastic armor guard and the thermoplastic one you can cut that off in a strip and wrap it around the hose afterwards and it again it just gives you something to uh to rub against before you start rubbing on the cover so a couple of little dodges there a couple of little things you can uh, obviously help yourself with to uh, make the uh, the hose a bit more uh, a bit more durable today's technology here we will see um uh, a cylinder uh, with a port and a rigid steel pipe. And the general idea is the cylinder's moving and we need to get the hydraulic fluid from the steel pipe into the into the cylinder. So normally what we would have is a couple of port adapters uh, or a tube fitting. And then we have the hose assembly with its constituent components, the hose material, and then the two couplings and then the coupling interface. And that gives us the degree of flexibility we need. And of course, there's uh, it's, a, it's an easy way of coupling everything up. It's not too difficult and it's quite, uh, quite cost effective to, uh, to use that to give us the, uh, the necessary move, movement that we want. The coupling interface, uh, its uh, basic function is it's got to be leak free of course and obviously we've got to hold the coupling on to the hose material so there's got to be a degree of retention and you can see from the picture in the bottom right hand corner the barbs obviously uh, it's an insert inside the uh, actual coupling inside the ferrule and that gives us the mechanical retention its qualities obviously the coupling has to re resist the uh, the pressure the idea is that the, the actual bore through the coupling itself, you've got to try and maximize that. We don't want to have any restrictions. Restrictions obviously uh, create heat. And of course, it's quite compact. It's quite space saving, uh, depending upon whether it be a straight or a 45 or a 90. There's a degree of compatibility, metal to metal and metal to rubber. It's really easy to install and obviously Whatever we throw at it as regards the environment or uh, the sort of the, the type of uh, job that it's doing, if it's a crop sprayer, the chemicals and all those sort of things, it obviously withstands all those environmental influences and there is a degree of corrosion resistance there. The leak-proof hose, the coupling interface, obviously determined by the profile of the insert, the characteristics of the hose tube, the fact that we're going to crimp it on correctly and obviously the type of ferrule. And here you will see a little section through the, uh, the mega crimp, the coupling interface. And on the left, you can see the, 
how the insert actually, uh, when it's joined together, it becomes a, a sort of a uniform diameter. And looking at the sort of two pictures on the right here, you can see how the uh, the forces of the retention are evenly distributed around the actual diameter of the hose. It's very, very concentric. Whereas in comparison with some of the competitors, you can see that it's a bit inconsistent and there are a few gaps and there's a potential for, uh, for leak puffs in that particular situation. And right at the bottom, you'll see the design. And as we mentioned, there are some some barbs on there and those bite through the wire. So that gives you the, the good mechanical retention. The couplings, well, yes, um, there are hundreds, if not thousands of all shapes, sizes and descriptions, as you can see from here, there are straights, there are 45s, there are 90s. Uh, yeah, there are too many to even sort of contemplate, but we have two humongous catalogs and inside those catalogs, uh, you will find a lot of different variants, jump sizes, um, yeah, I mean, I think if you if you've come if you want want to find something and spend half a day looking at something, then then you know this is something to consider. Um, but there are many 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 different types, and uh, I would suggest that if there's uh, something that you want to look at and you can't see it there, then uh, there's uh, several opportunities to make uh, various sort of different ones. So uh, give us a call and uh, we'll see what. Uh, what we can do if we haven't got it i'm sure we'll we'll think about it so yeah there's many many different types of couplings but they all use this <clears throat> this type of convention so this is a, a typical mega crimp coupling and they all follow the same basic code format so you normally start off with the hose size so this is a six so it's a three eighths the coupling type is a G and that is a, a mega crimp. So at the bottom there, you'll see the mega crimp. It's a one piece coupling. Then the end size again is a six. The fact that the end is a female, so it's a female swivel. The thread type is BSP, but it could easily be DIN. It could easily be SAE, it could be flat face, many, many different types, but they all follow the same convention. The coupling obviously has an O-ring seal and it has a swivel nut. So here, uh, the basic sort of format is presented, but the hose size could very easily be an 8G6, or it could be a 6G8. And again, there are many, many different uh, variants here, but they, you know, the point is they all follow the same format. So that's the mega crimp of one piece. And if we go to the global spiral, Again, you'll note the only difference here, the coupling type is a GS. Just denoting the fact that you obviously have the stem and then you also need the ferrule. Same format. A typical UK termination BSP. This just shows you the, the, the subtle differences um, between the male and the female. And again, you'll see 60 degree cone on the uh, on the inside of the of the male, and obviously on the the female, you have the uh, the female nipple there. And again, 60 degree there. So obviously, when you connect the threads up, then met metal to metal, and obviously then the O ring will then seal inside the uh, inside the cone. So that gives you your your joint, your connection. The assembly machines, uh, this is just one of uh, several uh, crimper machines that we have. So the MCX30, it's uh, a pretty good product, uh, robust, and obviously it'll do up to an inch and a quarter uh, hose assemblies. The die rack is on the front, and then the controls are on the front face of the panel there. And then you'll see just under the uh, 
the designation there, the actual gauge setting. Um, so yeah, very robust machine um, and well liked out in the uh, in the market. So here you'll see um, labeled up all the different uh, controls. So obviously number one, the emergency stop. Number two, the main on off. Items three and four, you press those buttons to either open or close the die. Uh, number five is the, the gauge, gauge setting. And obviously six then is the actual sort of crimping head and where the die, um, the die tool goes into and, uh, and locates. A couple of other ones to, uh, just to, uh, to show uh, the old hand pump type still still out there the old mc2501 a couple of people still got that and the various sub upright versions so there's uh you know a different uh different ones that you see every now and again uh, and the mainstay the fairly newest one the uh, the m630 that we've already sort of discussed and then just a couple of snapshots showing you the typical types of cutting machines the insertion depth gauge to mark up the hose to uh, ensure you've got full full insertion. The marking tool, the uh, the gates um, measuring equipment, uh, obviously the crimping machine, and then obviously cleanliness, which we uh, touched on uh, quite uh, some time ago. Um, we tend to use um, the the pellet gun to clean the uh, the bore. Of the hose up after it's been cleaned but there's several different ways of doing that just to recognize the fact that obviously you need to clean the hose after you've uh, made it and then cap it off afterwards to ensure that you've uh, keep the dirt away from uh, going inside practicalities so creating a an assembly and doing it safely you need to measure the hose, then cut it, mark it, insert it, orientate the ends relative to each other. You need the crimp data sheet, obviously, to get the relevant uh, dimensions to crimp it to. You then obviously crimp, and then you validate. You measure the crimp diameter with the, uh, the caliper. <clears throat> Determine the, the cut hose length. Uh, we in gates, we tend to go from cone to cone. So at the bottom there, you'll see the, the male cone and then the dimension going to the, the female cone. That would give you the overall assembly. And then we would then take off the, the dimension from the cone to uh, where the hose is sort of fully inserted to off, off both ends. Uh, it's not actually dimensioned up in the uh, diagram as anything, but it's, it's generally the dimension that's unmarked here. If you would take that off, that would then give you your cut hose length. <clears throat> Normally what, uh, what we do, um, we would sort of add a little bit on to uh, allow you to make sure you've got a nice, a nice good fit. We wouldn't make it size for size. We'd probably add probably an extra 10%. And then normally what we do is install the hose dry. So we've not actually crimped anything on and we then mark it up through the um, through the coupling onto the hose on both ends to actually make sure we get the right orientation. And then we would crimp it, and that would then um, fit in nice and snug into, uh, into your uh, assembly. And here it shows you the sort of process to go through. Um, the top, top right, you can use the insertion tool here where you put it into the aluminum block, it goes into a counter board and you mark it with a pen. That gives you the depth that obviously you need to uh, to make sure you're fully inserted. But in on the left-hand side here, you've got obviously the points one, two, and three. It shows you um, how you would insert it um, using your finger uh, a line on the length of the coupling. But the important thing here is when you're cutting the, the hose end, got to try and cut it as square as you possibly can. And we normally say uh, the maximum cut angle is about five degrees. 
try and keep it as straight as you can because obviously what you don't want is point contact one side of the ferrule and a gap at the other side. So try and get it as square as you possibly can when you cut it. Then you place the hose next to the coupling and use your thumb to give you the, uh, the depth of the insertion there. And then just gives you a line of sight. You then push it in until you reach that point and that just makes sure you're fully engaged. And for the two piece, again, it shows you on the right hand side here, it shows you the ferrule on the end of the hose and just make sure that you're right up against the stem shoulder. You've obviously pushed the, uh, uh, the stem in and you're as tight up as you possibly can. And here, this tends to be uh, a little bit more on the, on the more difficult side, especially on the, the global spirals. The hoses are a bit bigger and a bit chunkier as are the coupling. So sometimes you have to use a bit of brute force and ignorance to persuade them, but also you can use a little bit of lightweight oil just to give you that little bit of lubrication to uh, ensure that you're fully engaged. The orientation of the hose, um, again, there's several different conventions here, but essentially it's the face of the clock. So you've actually made the first end and you've made that vertical and then you look down the bore of the hose towards that vertical end and you then rotate end to uh, in accordance with the clock face. So vertical to vertical, you would say that's zero and then obviously 90, 180, 270 and anywhere in between there, that would then give you the orientation of the, of the two ends to make sure that uh, it's compatible with what you're aligning up to on on the uh, the installation of the application gates has a an e crimp database and this is available for for anybody to to go on to and have a look um, and here you would normally put in the type of machine that you have so uh, mcx30 you'll see highlighted blue and then if you jump to the, the hose description and then the hose dash size and then the stem size, it will then automatically give you the right die set to use in the machine. If you then click add results to list, it then lists everything out in the bottom snapshot here, which shows you the dash size, the type of material you put in M2T, of course, the working pressure, and then the important dimension to check is the outside crimp diameter. So 21.85 millimeters and the tolerance is plus or minus 0.25. So when you've crimped the hose and you want to check and verify, that's what you've got to comply with. And of course, the other, the other thing you need to get here is which die set to, to use. So D22 and the gauge setting on the machine needs to be at 2.15. All that information there is on the eCrimp database. Um, you can download it, but there is an easier way and perhaps a slightly better way. And Gates has made up this uh, mobile phone app. It's downloadable from um, the, uh, the uh, Google Play or App Store and it's really quite intuitive and very very clever normally you would download it and obviously then you would then select the crimper you see here selected the mcx30 we've selected the the hose type m2t and then selected the dash size and then the stem g and then this is all the important information that you want on this last snapshot here. So it tells you the die set is D33, the gauge setting 1.25, and the outside diameter of the crimp that you need to check and verify at the end is 25.14 plus or minus 0.25 millimeters. So safe crimper, the operation, safety glasses, stay clear of the equipment, no loose closing, make sure the, uh, the actual machine is securely mounted and follow the instructions.
procedure here in the various bullet points, obviously you would uh, get all the necessary information from the data sheet and make sure you've got the right hose material, the right couplings, the right gauge setting, and then you would load the dies into the crimper. You then locate the crimp position. You set the gauge to the correct value, and then you insert the hose and locate the ferrule within the dies five millimeters from the front of the dies and that ensures it's fully engaged along the whole length. And then wearing your PPE, you will then activate the crimping mechanism and then remove the assembly from the dies. You'd measure the crimp diameter, and verify the hose, and you would cap it. And that's it. You would then proceed to check the crimp diameter here using the uh, the vernier and the vernier has got some little reliefs in the, uh, the top end of the jaws that would then verify the crimp diameter she so would actually go for the valleys rather than measuring across the ridges and that would ensure that you've actually crimped it to the right dimensions if you don't then the four snapshot here, four pictures show you exactly where you've gone wrong. So bottom bottom left, obviously you've squeezed it too much. You've over crimped it. The top one, I've squeezed it enough. It's completely under crimped. And then the, the other two, the mushroom flare and the tail flare, obviously here you've engaged the, uh, the hose either too far forward or too far backwards. And of course, uh, you've got the uh, the flare up at the uh, the back end or at the front end. So each and every one of those would uh, be a potential for a coupling to either leak or possibly blow off. Thank you very much for participating. I hope it's been informative and uh, talk to you all very soon. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to you all.